Good morning and welcome to the University of New England Center for Global Humanities. I am Nicole Trufant, UNE's Vice President of Finance and Administration. Our Center Director, Dr. Anwar Majid, is flying back from Morocco today and cannot join us. He wishes you a wonderful event. We are proud to support the Portland community by sponsoring today's event. UNE and the City of Portland, as well as our region, share the same concerns and have the same aspirations for growth and prosperity. I hope the activities in today's program will help us move in that direction. And now to our keynote speaker for the morning. An accomplished city planner, educator, and author, she is the founder of Civic Moxie, a planning, urban design, and placemaking group in Brookline, Massachusetts. She holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from Pratt Institute and a master's city planning from MIT, where she taught for 13 years and conducted important research on empowering communities to take charge of positive change. She is the lead author of the recent publication, Places in the Making, How Placemaking Builds Places and Community. Her work focuses on moving communities from planning to doing through what she calls a collaborative roadmap, a process developed at Civic Moxie, one that she will share with us today. She has led waterfront planning efforts in Boston and in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and recently created a master plan for the New Arts District in New Rochelle, New York. All her work encourages collaboration among working groups that is focused on building trust and enduring frameworks for action. She has served as Associate Director of the Northeast Mayor's Institute on City Design and most recently led the Manchester Connects planning effort, a project connecting people, places, and ideas in the historic Amherstgig mill yards with downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. She regularly speaks across the nation on the power of collaboration and placemaking, most recently at the Royal Technical Institute in Stockholm, Sweden in June. Please join me in giving a warm Portland welcome to our beloved and at times beleaguered city to this year's Challenge of Change keynote speaker, Susan Silberberg. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Is everyone awake? You had your coffee? I want to talk this morning, it really is about the challenge of change. And as I like to think of it, do we think change or do we think transformation? So now that you're here to see and hear my talk, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Everyone close, I can see you all, I know who's cheating. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to think of a time in your life where change was imposed on you. It may have been a work change, a relationship, um, friends, family, and think about how it made you feel to have this change imposed on you. So just take a moment to do that. Get that image. Okay, if you can open your eyes, tell me, a few of you, what you were thinking. Resentful, Resentful. okay. Fearful. Fearful, yeah. Tired. tired. Anybody else? Resentful, fearful, tired. Uncertain. Uncertain and disenfranchised. Okay, um, change is hard. <laughs> Listen to all of that. Um, this change um, is so hard. When I did a little bit of a web search in preparing for this talk, there were a lot of um, really inspirational quotes that came up on the web. You know, how, how, how can you help change? You know, it's outside your comfort zone, but it's where the magic happened. Change is scary, but not as scary as staying the same forever. I love when the winds of change blow, some people build walls and others build windmills. So um, there's a lot of inspiration out there because of this scary, fearful, resentful, tired feeling we get around change. And so you've been experiencing a lot of change here in Portland. Um, that there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of new construction, there are new people in the city, new uses. Um, you're seeing things that were familiar disappear. Um, and all of that can make you feel distrustful, anxious, tired, resentful. So what I want to do this morning is talk through that a little bit. 
Um, I have up the complete city maps as an extension of this. The Portland Society of Architecture asked um, people to map the city. They had a blank map, a wonderful exercise. These are some of the responses, and I'll show others later that are more uplifting. <laughs> but these are some of the responses to that feeling of anxiety um, and apprehension about change within this. And there are a couple of expletives in these, so you'll excuse those and just... But really how people are feeling. Protect the past um, here. No luxury condos. We don't like the rich people moving in and taking over everything that we've had. Um, keep these neighborhoods family friendly. Now I want you to close your eyes again. I want you to think of a moment in your life where something was transformed, where your work, a relationship, it was a transformative moment that was a positive experience that got you into another place. Really get a vision of a transformation of some kind in your life. Okay, tell me how you were feeling. Hopeful. Belonging. Belonging. Empowered. Em empowered. Connected. Connected. Energized. Energized. Yeah. Interesting, we heard connected and belonging, the sense of really being a part of something, right? This energy, this positive feeling. I want to talk this morning about how communities change that kind of helpless feeling of change coming at them to a sense of transformation, a metamorphosis during a life cycle of a city, and what that, what that can feel like, how communities can do it, and how you're, you're on the way to that, and how to grab hold of that. The complete city maps, others that were drawn, showed images of the future. Um, they showed beloved things. They showed things people wanted to protect. Visions of what everyone wanted. Safe bike path. Um, to have more solar public lighting. Less cars. Improve the metro. Look at that. Awesome up there. This real sense of optimism. Visit Portland. More bike paths. More outside patios. Connected green spaces a really kind of proactive vision of what the future of Portland can be. And look at the details here. This person knows exactly where those bike paths should be, where the connected green spaces need to be. A real sense of how can you transform the city. And so what I'd like to do is think about the difference between change and transformation and what those qualities of that are. Um, for communities. And in order to do that, I'd like to shift from you thinking about the built environment and the things you don't like, the things you're resentful of, the things that are just unknown and uncertain, um, the construction, changes in people who are here, higher buildings, denser buildings, more traffic. And I want you to stop. And I want you to shift gears and to think about how you are in the world of Portland. Not the built environment, but you personally, an organization you might belong to, and how you act within the community. Because the transformation of thinking, of transforming as opposed to changing, really begins with a systems approach of how you are in the world. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what's needed for that transformation when you step out of this is what I'm reacting to in the built environment, and you think about this is how I want to act for transformation. What I see in my work and my research is that these are things that are present, not necessarily in all of those transformations, but these, many of them, are present in all of them. And I'd like to walk you through with a few examples here and then tie it back in um, to Portland and where you are and where you might go. And the first one is this sense of collaboration and it ties back when you were thinking about transformation, the words that came up were connected and belonging. 
And you do that through collaboration. And this really ties back to research I did at MIT around this notion of placemaking, which is really the act of people coming together in their physical environment to deliberately, and that's a really important word, to deliberately design, plan, program, and maintain public spaces, to facilitate social interaction, and to improve your quality of life. And it's not just showing up at a public meeting. Notice it isn't just to come together to give an opinion. It's all of those active things after that. And I want to talk briefly about a project in Bernal Heights in San Francisco and really illustrates this notion of collaboration quite well. This neighborhood um, was six lanes wide on this street, on uh, Guerrero Street in San Francisco. And neighbors on one side of the street didn't know neighbors on the other. So you can picture this really kind of the equivalent of a freeway width going through your neighborhood. And some residents likened it to a traffic sewer. That's what they call this street. And regularly there were problems with cars going so fast that they would actually just crash in to people's living rooms on that street. And one day, a resident was really fed up with this, and she went door to door um, to try to get everyone together to think about doing something. And it really took that personal door to door, come work with me, in order for this community to come together and to go to the city and to say, we need something done about these six lanes of traffic. Now, San Francisco is pretty much like every other city. You don't have funds for absolutely everything you want to do. Um, and so San Francisco Department of Transportation came back with a proposal and said, we'll put up some seed money, but if you can raise the rest of the money in this neighborhood and you can figure out how to share not just the construction of helping do traffic calming on the street, but also the ongoing maintenance of doing this, because we don't have the funds to, for another park. Um, we'll go ahead with this project. We'll provide the planning money and the design money. We'll give some seed money, and we'll do a kind of temporary park here, which is about all we can afford. And the residents came together, and they raised their half of the money. And perhaps most importantly, they had to figure out how to be in this community together. They had to figure out what house the hose and the gardening implements were going to be at that month, and how they were going to rotate that schedule of responsibilities to take care of the park. And so that whole process of maintaining and building this park really built a community, a community of connections here. And so going from the six-lane wide traffic sewer to a completed park um, enabled them to begin to connect across to their neighbors on the other side of the street, made a connection to the city, which was actually the beginning of San Francisco's pavement to parks program, um, and created this collaborative, really success story that showed what can happen in really in a, a world of limited resources for all of us when people can come and put their heads together, not only in a community, but also with city government. There are lots of stories like these. You can read my white paper, which is less than a nickel or a dime uh, online. You can download it for free. Um, but show that this widening emphasis away from products, away from the actual park or the bench, um, to focus on the process is really recognizing long-term importance of nurturing community capacity and local leadership. And this mutual stewardship of place and community is what we've called at MIT the virtuous cycle of placemaking. Because if you're looking at the whole span of a project, there's an entry point here for almost everyone. There's some way to come into a project. It might be organizing because you want to get something done, that woman going door to door, or deliberating and having public meetings. Or perhaps you're the team of, um, you're giving pro bono from the landscape architecture office and you're helping with design, or the foundation that's raising money. All along this cycle is an opportunity for community to connect and to build projects and to improve quality of life. And so in this mutual stewardship of place and community, community transforms place, which in turn transforms community 
and so on. Another quality is many projects, not all, but many, are proactive, not reactive. It's about saying, I'm going to take charge of a situation, and I'm going to determine the outcome. Because change is inevitable, but progress is optional. You could change here in Portland, but show no progress. But not changing is not an option. You can't hold everything still right where it is. It will wither and die. Cities are living organisms. You cannot stop them from changing as much as everyone would love to see that happen in places around the city. And so your only choice is death or progress. It's not a difficult choice. And um, this, this being proactive, the other magic I've learned from this is that it brings people together because coming together around positive actions as opposed to with rancor and bitterness and resentment is a much more joyful experience of collaboration. And so that's a bit of magic in and of itself. And I want to talk about a proactive movement um, that's uh, spreading across the country and around the world, which is instead of saying, no, not in my backyard, instead of saying, I'm reacting to this, people are coming together to say, yes, in my backyard, yimbi. Yes, I want change. And that process of saying yes makes me a partner with the change agents. When you say no, you're not a partner. When you say yes, you are a partner. And this is mainly groups of people in high housing cost areas, and I would put Portland in that category, who have said saying no to increasing the supply of housing is raising our housing costs. And if we can say yes to housing, we can get more supply, which will reduce our housing costs, and we have control over what kind of housing we want. Um, and it's a growing movement that is really looking at being proactive and partners in that development process as opposed to being reactionary and stopping. Clear and specific vision is very, very important. You have to know where you're going in order to get there. And the more specific you can be, the better. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a project. and I, I, um, I don't like to say that we just finished this project at Civic Moxie because I think it's just begun. Matter of fact, they just had a launch event two weeks ago. Um, Manchester Connects is a project where the vision came from a group of citizens that have been working for a long time to get a river walk along the Merrimack River in the mill yard in downtown and it's never quite gotten off the ground. And they came together oh, about three or four years ago now, and started talking. Three former mayors, former economic development director, uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce, a whole group of people, citizens, property owners, and said, we really want to do this. They did this without official sanction from the city. City Hall wasn't on board, although the planning department was supportive. Um, and they came together and they got a DOT grant from New Hampshire DOT for a multimodal land use uh, multimodal transportation and land use study, because that's where the money was. Um, and we looked at that project, Civic Moxie got the project, and we rebranded it almost immediately because I don't know anyone who gets excited about a multimodal transportation and land use project, um, except maybe some transportation engineers who I love dearly, but it wasn't going to get the rest of the community excited. And we came together and thought about what that project was really about, and it was about belonging, and it was about connectedness. And that fit pretty well with multimodal. And so um, those citizens came together and had a vision that that whole city that has so many extraordinary things going on would be connected and everyone wouldn't necessarily have to agree on everything, but they would all be moving in the same direction. Because the frustration in Manchester is that all the parts are so wonderful and they can't quite figure out how to make it more than that. It never quite gets to the level they want it to be at. And so this idea about just taking the organizations and the spaces and the people and bringing it together in some way to be connected. And I would say that there are great similarities here with Portland. And um, that project involved the downtown, the mill yard, the Riverwalk, and it really was focusing on history, 
um, but it was all about moving toward the future. And they were very clear they were not going to let history tie them down. That if Manchester was a city about innovation, that they were going to continue to be innovative. That they couldn't get stuck and say, that's it, that's a snapshot in time. And so they were thinking about uh, what do we do? And the, and the recommendations that came out of that were about celebrating public space, being host to a world-class river walk and an iconic pedestrian bridge, encouraging dense mix of land uses, um, supporting innovative parking strategies, embracing complete streets, and powered by a new organization called Manchester Connects. And so it appears that the Chamber of Commerce is going to be kind of the host for that organization instead of spinning off for a new one. And that's going to be the leader for this new effort that brings together the chamber and economic development and businesses and landowners to say we're going to move forward. And their launch project, because they felt they really had to demonstrate they could do something, is this pedestrian, bicycle, connected, um, accessible loop from Elm Street down to the Mill Yard and the Riverwalk. And uh, we're doing kind of temporary, what we call tactical urbanism. Um, and they know they're going to need everyone on board for this. So that diagram on the left is a pretty typical diagram of how to get projects done and how to move things and transform things in cities. They don't have government in here so much at the local level. City Hall still isn't on board. But city planning is helping as much as they can and they've rallied so we've done these action kits for them. And everyone's taken an action kit on a different topic and they're running with it. Um, because they know they can do this. They can do this even without City Hall. And they had their launch event two weeks ago. It's my favorite picture ever on the right, that little dog on the Manchester Connects uh, symbol. A great success. Um, these are some of the founders of, of the group who started. But very excited to be moving. And they have a very clear vision. They are just going straight for that vision. So you've got the vision and now you need indicators of success. How are you going to know if you're on the right track and how, what are those indicators so that you know if all of your policies and your efforts are where they should be? Questions like, how many units of housing do we need to house people? How many affordable units would we need in town? How many knowledge workers do we want to attract? How many new businesses need to be here? Um, how many miles of bike paths? How many new art patrons do we need to make sure that our arts and cultural organizations are healthy and solid? How many fewer crimes would we like committed? How many more engaged citizens? Picking measurable ways to measure success is very, very important. So you can give us a scorecard and you can also say, well, wait a minute, that policy really isn't on track. It's not gonna get us where we wanna go. Um, we have a collaborative road mapping process at Civic Moxie. It's not perfect. We kind of made it up because we were seeing these things happening in communities, so it's constantly changing. But it's really about taking a simple idea with a group of people and saying, what do you want to achieve? And then breaking it into smaller goals. Um, and then breaking it into smaller and smaller goals, and then really evaluating each one. Do we have the capacity to do that? Do we have the people? Do we have the resources? Do we have the political will? And if we don't, can we get them? And then we have to bring those people into the conversation right away. And maybe it's something you put on the side for a while until you can hone down on how you want to move forward and you have everyone on board in that process to, to go forward with that. So along with that comes the need to be transparent. And that includes being inclusive um, so that everyone knows what you're doing. They may not agree with it, but that everyone knows and there are no suspicions. So this collaborative road mapping process happened in Manchester in working group meetings that we set up that were advertised. Anyone could join a working group. And you know, head of the chamber was there, former mayors were in that working group, met every two weeks. Anyone could come to that meeting and they did. And if they were willing to work and stick with it, they stayed and some people came and then they left again. And at the end, we had that core group of about 20 people who were ready to move forward on the project. City planners were there in the room. We had uh, public works, we had parks. So we had the right people in the room. And because of that transparent process, um, we had a lot of support uh, for what the final projects were that we chose to move ahead. 
And then the advisory board, our recommendations for that, and it's changing as they're pulling it together, which really have a wide spread across the community. There's another part to transparency that I, I kind of a subpart, education. It's really important that everyone make educated decisions as much as you can. So I'm going to, uh, every place we work, I hear from neighborhoods, they want a coffee shop, and some neighborhoods still even hold out for an independent bookstore. Um, and these many times are the same neighborhoods who are telling me that growth is happening and it's too much and they don't want any more housing in their neighborhood. And I'll say to them, if you don't want more housing in your neighborhood, you're not going to get a coffee shop. And they kind of look at me and say, why won't the city give us a coffee shop? <laughs> and it takes a lot of explanation to understand that those locational decisions about the coffee shop are made by companies who look at how many households are in that neighborhood and what the disposable income, median income level is, and they've got formulas and they're going to decide how many coffee shops exist and so many, you know, square miles, and they're going to figure out if you can do that. And that if you have more density, you have more services and you have more of what you want. Um, and that's a real eye-opener for some people, and that whole transparency is also about education and frank discussions about what you can have and what you don't necessarily um, have within that. Because at the end of the day, you've got planning and you've got implementation, and there's this whole gap in between of resources and capacity. And we have to figure out how to meet that. Some of that might be met with money, might be met with a grant, it could be volunteer, it could be philanthropy, it could be city money. It might be met by just saying, we're gonna provide more density, we're going to um, recruit more tourists. Um, all of those have trade-offs that then have to be discussed because there are negatives and positives. But it's on the table for what might happen. Because at the end of the day, no city that I know of has the funds and the resources to do it alone. And more and more, they're about partnerships. How do we connect and how do we make sure that this inclusive process actually brings advocates to the table that can get a project done? And then there's trust. And so that trust comes from all of those other processes and there's really no way to substitute in. You can't just show up at a meeting and say, trust me. I have two uh, quick stories about trust and how people have come together. And one of them I was um, involved with in a tangential way and was on the board then for a while. The Joshua Bates School in Boston is an art center. It's an old elementary school in the South End, priciest real estate in Boston in the South End right now and when this was built. And the Joshua Bates School was given for use um, to artists, there are 20 affordable art studios there, very low cost art studios. And the land around it was owned by the Boston Redevelopment Authority and in 2003, the Boston Redevelopment Authority put out an RFP for development of the land around the Joshua Bates School and the Joshua Bates School was part of the development parcel. And I happen to know very dearly um, one of the sculptors and he called me up and he said, the developer's coming, that's the end of our lives, I've gotta find other studio space, and I happen to know the developer, New Atlantic, because it's a mission-driven developer, um, and he does a lot of artist space, did Midway Studios conversion a few years ago. He's committed to these kinds of projects. And I said, give Peter a chance, and, um, and Alan said, this is not gonna happen, and he rallied all of the artists together, they made a big protest, and I said, you have to trust the process. And so what basically happened was the Joshua Bates studio is now permanently in management and organizational structure that the artists control that studio. It is managed by the developer in a very savvy way to keep costs down. Um, it's a, it's a, artists um, are on the board as well as the developer. I was on the board for a while as kind of an outside advocate. And then this whole project built up around a call art block which has 20 affordable artists live workspace. This, the school is just workspace, plus luxury condos in the building as well. And the luxury condos made the rest of the project doable. And now that is permanently protected space uh, within that. And that, that trust had to be developed over time. Um, 
I'm going to go through this very quickly. Worked in Santorce, Puerto Rico, and San Juan. Poorest as well as richest neighborhood in Puerto Rico. You can see those census tracts up there along the water. Very wealthy. Down below, um, not so much within the neighborhood. And there's, there's a piece of property that was cleared for urban renewal, and everyone was forced off of that site. Poor people, really extraordinarily desperately poor people, a number of years ago. And there was a mixed-use project that started around it, and that project went bankrupt. Puerto Rico has been struggling for a long time, even more than it is now after the horrific hurricane events. And a developer from Greenwich, Connecticut came down and bought that mixed-use property and moved his family there and did something that no other developer from the mainland ever did, is he hired all local Puerto Ricans to run that project with him, trying to build trust. But the holdouts in the neighborhood met with me and they said, we have to protest this, he wants to lease that land to build a park and we have to stop him. And I said to them, this was the head of museums, uh, people, and I said, you want a park, why do you want to stop him? He can't develop it, he's going to take it from us, he's going to say it's a park and it's going to be a parking lot. And, and I said, do you have money for the park? We think it's going to take seven to ten million dollars for that park. And they said, no, we don't have any money for the park. And I said, why don't you go talk to the developer? And they, we can't talk to the developer. Eight months of discussions before they finally were able to talk to the developer who was waiting to talk to them because he knew he needed them. He wanted to know what the community wanted and wanted them on board to move ahead. Um, he's just managed to lease the land um, from the government and he's going ahead with paying for the park improvements and has asked the neighborhood to pitch in in terms of maintenance and can they be involved in kind of a community effort on maintenance. Um, and so the neighborhood's going to get their park um, and beginning to build trust. And then the last piece of this is leadership. Absolutely critical, I save the best for last. Strong leadership in order to be transformative in terms of change. I'm going to go through this very quickly. I spoke at a placemaking conference in Oklahoma at the State University this spring, and the keynote speaker at the luncheon was Mayor Jim Brainerd of Carmel, Indiana. Has anyone ever heard of Carmel, Indiana? Extraordinary leader. He got up there and mesmerized us, was supposed to talk for 40 minutes. An hour and a half later, we were all waiting. Give us more, give us more. Um, Carmel was voted the number one best place to live in America in 2012. It's also the fastest growing town in America. Think about that. The fastest growing place is also the best place to live. It's possible. It's within reach. And what he did was he said, we're going to take charge of change. This is what it looked like at the top, and this is what it looks like at the bottom at the entrance to the arts district. He created an arts and design district that had nothing there. It was an empty field and a warehouse. And he put up those two brick, at the top right, two brick pylons, and the, his opponent in the mayoral election in the late 90s made fun of him. They cost $200,000. And his opponent said, there's nothing there. Why are you wasting everyone's money? And he had a vision. There are over 120 arts and design businesses in that art and design district now, in Carmel, Indiana. And he's used development as a way to pay for everything that the community wanted. And so he talks about density. He, that's been transformed now into this corner in a matter of 20 years. And he said, our zoning only allowed for two stories, but that meant they were going to have to put surface parking on the lot. And that meant we weren't going to get as much tax revenue. And it was going to be ugly. So I let them do two stories underground of parking. And I let them build a lot more density, and now we're getting four times the amount of tax revenue, and we have a beautiful building to boot. And he's really got the economics of this figured out. Um, and he's done this, these are some of their accomplishments, just from 2004 to 2008. He is on a roll. Um, and they've built a whole city center site here by saying, you know what, if we can say to developers, yes, we can do more density, you're going to have to give us excellent design in public spaces, a lot can happen. This is what the city center site looks like today, including this concert hall here on the left. They've just built it recently. And so he's managed to take kind of talking with developers and understanding development economics and get what the community wants. 
through a very open, inclusive process with community members, including bike paths and bike trails. So I, um, I want to just talk a little bit about moving forward here. Um, these are the principles and vision that came out of the comprehensive plan that was just released um, by the city. Equitable, sustainable, dynamic, connected, secure, and authentic. There are a lot of things in here. And thinking about how do you move forward, I see the path as one of a kind of systems approach of looking at all of the amazing things that are going on in Portland and saying, how can we align these things and how can we really make sure that we are getting the most for what all of our efforts are? I did a little quick list with some people um, I've been working with here of things that are going on in, um, in the city, right? How do all these align? Well, what I would urge you all to do, kind of give a challenge, is to take each of these and to think about what are the goals. Have everyone who's working on these things really kind of write out very clearly what your goals are. Think about your areas of interest. How do they overlap? And then what are these areas of alignment between them? And get together and start talking. Because the reality is if you look at some of the goals of the city, if you want to increase the workforce and job opportunities and you want to support arts and you want to strengthen schools, all of those things are tied together. And sitting in one room and talking about that alignment and talking about how you can get there is actually easier than you think. But it has to be a conversation. It's not going to happen any other way. And if everyone's working in their silos, you're going to have a lot of good projects that everyone has worked on really hard, but not necessarily going to equal kind of greater things. And I challenge you to think about who's going to lead this, because the city cannot do it alone. And you already have great leadership that started in this collaboration. But who's going to take the charge? And places that we see where things are transformative, it might be a community foundation that puts in some seed money to have someone who can be full-time kind of leading and convening the groups of people, including the city, and everyone making joint decisions. Maybe it's some civic-minded business that's willing to step up to the plate, or a series of area organizations that come together. But it needs leadership in order for it to truly happen and for everyone to be moving in the transformative way that you really want to be and that you want to leave for the next generation here. The end of the day, for me, placemaking isn't about making a place, a physical place, as much as it is making a place at the table. And the more people that can come to the table under leadership, the more that you can accomplish here in Portland. So I thank you very much, and I can't wait to see what happens here. <laughs>